even know how to start this. This is the first episode. Um, but let's just do it organic. So everyone, we're here. This is the first episode of the Millennium Falconers Book Club. This is Dylan. I am joined by my Jedi Master, Dr. Ryan Schlesinger. Ryan, how are you feeling today? I'm feeling pretty great. We're getting the book club off the ground. I'm so excited, and I want everyone to know, just right out of the gate, because this is something Ryan and I talked about. Originally, we were just going to be called the Millennium Falconers, and we were going to be a purely Star Wars podcast. But... I, I like to think it's because we are such learned gentlemen and not because I have ADD or anything like that. <laughs> but we wanted to give ourselves the option to talk about more than just Star Wars because at its heart, Star Wars is a story about life and a story about stories, if you will. And so we can more greatly appreciate Star Wars by talking about stuff like, I don't know, Norse mythology, definitely Joseph Campbell. J.R.R. Tolkien, stuff like that. And so Ryan, in the first of what I know is going to be like many, many amazing ideas to make the podcast better, says, hey, let's just call it the Millennium Falconers Book Club. And so now we like to imagine that on the Falcon, there is this beautiful library. And in that library, somehow there are books about Star Wars. Haven't really worked that one out yet. But also... Um, classics that had yet to be written because Star Wars is from a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. But it's okay. As uh, as we know and love about Star Wars, canon is kind of a fluid concept. Um, but but I'm excited, and we have a great book to talk about today. We're going to be talking about Claudia Gray's The High Republic, Into the Dark. Ryan, you're a Claudia fan, aren't you? I'm a huge Claudia fan. Uh, she's yeah. my favorite of the current canon authors. Oh, Ooh, yeah. with Timothy Zahn, too. I'll put her in company with Timothy Zahn. Um, her books are excellent. We've, we've been fanboys for Claudia Gray for a couple of years now. <laughs> no, we, we really have. I feel like, yeah. you know, so for those of you that kind of don't know, I want to talk about our true meet cute in a second. But since this is the first episode, I want to include some background on us, on the, on the show, on our interactions with Star Wars before we actually get into the meat and potatoes. But I remember, I think it was like 2018 or 2019, when I was reading the Disney canon novels and you mm -hmm. had kind of started reading the Disney canon novels. And we just got so hype. And I still remember it was Lost Stars by Claudia Gray, if I remember correctly. And, and it's just... She writes Star Wars and understands Star Wars the way that Dave Filoni understands Star Wars. Because I feel like anyone can write a Star Wars novel, but nine times out of ten it could end up sounding like fan fiction unless you're someone like Dave or Claudia and you actually understand the heart of Star Wars. And so that was kind of the, the initial meet-cute of the podcast. Um, that's when the seed was planted, if you will. That's when the spice was first mined. Well, and then um, I realized that when you invited me on your Shakespeare podcast, you were kind of vetting me and <laughs> and training me for podcasting, oh, trying yeah. to give me a, a little taste and uh, hook me. <laughs> Dude, that that's that's the thing is, and I love it because I don't know if you all can hear this in the background, but um, I'm you know I'm not doing laundry. That's not what that sound is. We're actually on the Millennium Falcon right now, and we're going through an asteroid field. So if you hear that in the background, um, we're all about you know, ambient noises here. But um, but no, for for those of you that listen to my erstwhile Shakespeare podcast, uh, the Lunatic, the Lover, and the Poet, yet another Bard Pod. It slowly kind of went from talking about Shakespeare <laughs> to finding a way to talk about Star Wars and having Ryan on the show, and we had so much fun doing that that. I think it was on my birthday, uh, 2020, whenever that final episode of The Mandalorian came out. And, you know, I, you could hear my head explode from Tulsa and I could hear your head explode <laughs> um, from Oklahoma City. And we just kind of decided, let's let's just do a Star Wars podcast. And I'm really excited to do this because kind of going back to the very beginning. So Ryan and I got to know each other um, in the most, I guess, apropos way possible for two people now hosting a star wars podcast and ryan was at ou as a grad student 
teaching yes, a class on Star Wars. So Ryan, why don't you tell everyone a little bit about that? That's right. Um, I had the great opportunity while I was getting my master's at OU in American literature to uh, propose and teach a couple of my own classes on subjects that I chose. And I had recently uh, gotten into the mythology of Joseph Campbell. So I worked, I worked at this grocery store in Norman in the, in the neighborhood, and there were these characters that always hung around the grocery store. And so I, I had a kind of a, a dual path education going on where I was in training to be an academic at OU, but then I was also hanging out with um, all of these, these neighborhood characters in Norman at the Midway grocery store, which is also a butcher shop, which is also a sandwich shop. And when you work there, you're in charge of everything. It's one person working the counter the whole time. <laughs> and so these locals would come in, lots of eccentrics and just really interesting people. And uh, this is where I found out about Joseph Campbell, uh, this this guy Claude, who was the shoe shine there. Uh, shout out to Claude. He introduced me to Joseph Campbell, uh, another patron Bob V introduced me to the I Ching and so even though it's just it's a little grocery store in the middle of Oklahoma any time of the day you could find us having these awesome conversations about philosophy and spirituality and and so I had this kind of double helix model of my education going on and when Claude introduced me to Joseph Campbell um, I started reading Campbell and seeing that these these references to Campbell from George Lucas and kind of put that together and the idea for the class came out of that and it's 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 just been awesome since then so I, I love I love that and they do I'm still convinced have one of the best sandwiches in Oklahoma it's so simple it's a great it's sandwich. so great yeah I uh, I ate there quite a bit and little did I know if I would have known about this background whenever I was actually eating there. It's pretty much like we have our own most Eisley Cantina. Yes, absolutely. In the middle of Norman. <laughs> Com complete with, you know, figuring Dan and the modal nodes just rocking out in the corner. Um, but, but no, so I actually, I took that class. I think I took like five of your classes or four of your classes in the span of one year because, you know, you taught Star Wars and the Hero's Journey. And then I also took the Beatles um, mm -hmm. and and sixties counterculture, and I took the Grateful Dead class yes. too. So that's three. Yes, I don't know how to I don't know how to count, <laughs> but um, but so Ryan is you know he jokes around that I was vetting him, but but honestly I kind of feel like I feel like the lawyer who's going to start his own new law firm and grabbing like the brilliant partner from the old law yeah. firm and bringing him <laughs> with him. Um, or I guess you could say, I feel like I'm starting my own faction of the Jedi Order, um, you know, breaking with the Jedi Order, much like the Sith did, and bringing one of the masters with me. So, Well, and that's, um, that's where I would have gone. This was the Palpatine long play. Oh, yeah. You, you, <laughs> you, I, prom I promise I'm not going to kill you yet, but we'll see. The only way you'll find out if I'm actually going to kill Ryan is if you continue to listen to this podcast. But <laughs> Yeah, stay tuned. But... but <laughs> And so what was your first experience with Star Wars? Like your, what's the earliest Star Wars memory you have? Uh, before I had ever seen Star Wars. Ooh. So very young. Um, and it's, it's a, you know, it's one of those kind of pseudo memories. Mm -hmm. um, my cousins were considerably older than I, I was. So the, the one that was closest to my age, I was the oldest of my brothers and he was the youngest of his siblings. And he was uh, about 10 years older than me. And I, when I was younger than I can remember, but I had this figure for a long time. He, I went over one day and he was playing with all of his Star Wars, the legit original Kenner action figures. Oh yeah. I know. So cool. And I was just transfixed. It's like, what the hell? What is this? And yeah. he gave me a Chewbacca. <laughs> and so that's like, if you, if you want to know the first like time that I encountered Star Wars, it was that. What a way to start. It's pretty cool. 
What about what, when was the first time? Like, do you remember the first movie you saw and the circumstances around it? I mean, that's I've I've seen them so many times at this point. That's really yeah. difficult. Um, I yeah. I mean, I like to ask there. impossible questions. Yeah, I I know you do. <laughs> that's why I signed up for the pod. <laughs> I. Uh, uh, how about you? Do you remember? So, I I you know I like to joke around that uh, that that when I'm not podcasting, I'm a litigator, and so you learn as a litigator um, to always ask questions you have an answer to. Mm. Um, and so your question was, what was the first time you remember seeing Star Wars? And I'll tell you what, what when that was because I specifically remember. I know I had seen it before this instance, but the most vivid memory of Star Wars for me was when I was about five years old, six years old. My aunt and uncle, shout out to Kristen and Dale, they lived in Evanston, Illinois. Um, and I remember a lot of things about this trip that I took to, to Chicago and you know, to, to Evanston. We would ride around on the on the L, the elevated train. I love that. Um, we got stellar seats to a Cubs baseball game, but awesome. I got bored. I got bored um, really, really early, and I allegedly I kept screaming that I wanted to go home uh, so much. Oh, actually, I wanted to ride. <laughs> I wanted to ride the train. Is apparently what I was yelling. <laughs> but I wanted to ride the train so bad that, and I was yelling it so much that some of the Chicago fans. Were, who were sitting around us were like, let the kid ride the L, get him out of here. <laughs> so, so my, uh, my dad and my uncle are still kind of bitter about that. My uncle actually brought it up at my wedding. Um, but <laughs> so it will make a hell of a toast. <laughs> oh yeah. So it was the, it was the same trip, but I, uh, I had, or excuse me, they had a TV in their basement and they had the Star Wars movies on VHS. Now, keep in mind, this was before Lucas uh, did all the remasters. So mm-hmm. these were the theatrical releases um, that I actually still have on VHS. And we went down into the basement and we watched The Empire Strikes Back. That's the earliest Star Wars that I remember seeing. And I remember being horrified when Luke got his hand cut yeah. off. Spo- spoilers, by the way. This is a very spoilery uh, Star Wars podcast. If, and if you haven't seen it, why, why are you listening? But anyway, thank you for, for giving us a chance. <laughs> but I remember, it's funny that you said, you know, the brain is an interesting thing because you have, you have memories, but then the further away you get from that memory, the more your, your, your own brain kind of paints in details that may or may not be there. And this is a perfect example is I remember, you know, the scene's really famous, you know, Vader's, you know, beating on him with his lightsaber and then just cuts off his hand at the wrist. But in my head, he cut off Luke's entire arm. And so I remember, I remember thinking, oh my gosh, Vader cut off Luke's arm. And then only after rewatching, I'm like, okay, it's just a hand. So that should let the listeners know that I am prone to exaggeration in all things. Um, so I will try and make sure that I, I remember the wrist and not the arm when it comes to conversations about Star Wars. But from then on, I, uh, I was all in. I, you know, that, that second round of toys that came out around the time Lucas did the remasters and mm-hmm. kind of in anticipation of episode one, I had all of them. I still have this little, it's, I don't even know if it's an action figure because it's like it's made of rubber. Like it's almost like the same rubber as a bouncy ball, but it's just of the well, at that time the emperor because you know Darth Sidious slash Palpatine I don't right. think existed at that time, and he just looks like he looks like that that Jesus statue in a in 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 is it in South America I think where he's like standing yeah, there Brazil. Christ the Redeemer yeah uh-huh. Christ the Redeemer except it's Palpatine that's um, terrifying. So, yeah, it's pretty terrifying. I gotta take a picture and put it on. The, I gotta put it on the social if I remember when yeah. this episode is released. We need to do but, a Star um, Wars show and tell. Oh yeah, and and you all, you you've got to know that. So I'm sitting in my office upstairs in Oklahoma City, and um, my wife and I uh, decorated it together, which also means that I gave my wife, you know, deference because she's much better than I am at decorating stuff. And so my one little contribution to the room is back there, and it's a. La La Land IMAX poster, but I am just sitting here in awe of 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 Ryan's like space, 
And I know this is, <laughs> you know, like I know this is an, an audio medium. And so you all have no idea what I'm talking about. But we, uh, we if you look back on our Instagram, we posted a picture of, uh, of, of this recording session. And you'll see we've got, it looks like we have an X-Wing up there. There's an X-Wing, yeah. And, and then what, what do we have on the other side? Is that? So that's a, that's Kranix ship Kranix, uh oh, shuttle yeah. <laughs> and then um right next to it is kylo ren's ship and uh just out of the frame there oh slave one slave one oh dude. gotta love slave one and my my falcons down here that was um these are these are lego models and the falcon i got um when i won my fantasy football league dude. one year and i used the winnings to buy that as my trophy so i'm particularly proud of it but the reason it's all in here is kind of the opposite of you and leslie Mm -hmm. my wife sarah told me this stuff's got to go so you can (laughs) (laughs) you can put it in your office if you want but other than that it's not going to go anywhere else in the house so it's all crammed in here so our the next plan that leslie and i have is after you know everyone anyone who's married knows that that things go in stages it's almost a a one for you one for me uh, three for us, one for you, one for me, three for us kind of thing when it comes to investments. But one thing that Leslie and I have on the horizon is I want to get one of those tiny homes, like one of those, those sheds. Mm-hmm. And that's going to be where I put all of my nerd stuff because I think I was telling, <laughs> I, I was it. telling Ryan off mic that I love star Wars Legos. And I, 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 I built, uh, I think Poe Dameron's X wing, uh, Kylo Ren's tie silencer. I built a BB eight, but the problem is I don't have anywhere that I can put it because I love our house, but it's an old house. It was built in the thirties. And so it has like thirties storage. Um, and so I end up just giving them all to my nephews who are obsessed with Legos and star Wars. And so, you know, what, what's that line that, 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 uh, Yoda says to Luke at the last Jedi, you know, we, they, they out, they outgrow Ooh, what it's, we, um, that's a good one. Mm hmm. We are what they grow beyond. That is the true burden of all mastery. Yeah, that and that's pretty much my situation with Legos is I build it <laughs> as the master. And then it's almost like that other quote that, you know, a, a, you know, true masters, you know, plant trees under which they will never gather shade or whatever it is. So I'm passing this on to the next generation, which talk about trippy whenever my nephew turned four. The question was right after um, The Force Awakens came out. So my question was, do I give him the original trilogy toys or Mm -hmm. do I give him the sequel trilogy toys? And I opted for both because I don't like choices, which is why I would probably be a Sith and not a Jedi. Well, I don't Um, know. That's that's like Luke's choice, right? The Emperor says you must kill Darth Vader and become my apprentice. And Obi-Wan and Yoda say you must kill Darth Vader. Um to rid the galaxy of the evil and Luke makes the third choice, which is how I see what you just did is you made the third choice. I am the Luke Skywalker of choosing (laughs) star Wars toys for my nephews. That's, that's what I want everyone to understand. So before we dive in to this, our first book of the millennium Falconers book club, I want to kind of give you all an idea of what you can expect of this podcast of what you can expect um, from each episode and of what you can expect, I guess, from Ryan and I. So each month we're going to be reading a book. Most likely it'll be a Star Wars book at the beginning, but then we're going to jump around a little bit. As I said at the beginning, we're going to read some Joseph Campbell. We're going to read some Norse mythology. We're going to read some J.R.R. Tolkien. We're going to read some Neil Gaiman. We're going to dive anywhere and everywhere um, because, and I think I said this on my Shakespeare podcast, much like Hamlet, we could pretty much relate everything uh, back to Star Wars if we need to. You don't even need to put a gun to our head. You know, you give us a sandwich at Midway and we'll still do it. We'll especially do it then. But um, today, as I said at the start of this episode, we are talking about The High Republic Into the Dark by um, the Queen Bee herself, Claudia Gray. Um, and I, it's just, it's so good. And the way we're going to do this is... We're going to start at the top with just a synopsis. We're going to talk about characters, and then we're just going to get into the meat of the book before Ryan and I make the determination that I think everyone's here for, which is what does this mean 
for the larger Star Wars universe. Because the purpose of this podcast is to let people know what's going on in the canon, in the extended canon, since Disney took it over. Because the one thing they've done, infamously, I think, is they will introduce a tiny aspect of a character, a tiny aspect of a planet, and then have an entire spin-off comic series about it, or an entire book about it. The most famous example, of course, is when C-3PO walks up in The Force Awakens and goes, I bet you didn't recognize me because of my red arm. And then everyone's like, okay, yeah, what's the deal with the red arm? Don't worry. There's a whole comic book series about it, and it's actually a tearjerker, and I highly recommend it. But, Ryan, what do we need to know about the High Republic Into the Dark? Well, so first, I'd, I'd just like to reiterate uh, that Dylan and I have not met a Claudia Gray novel that we didn't like. And That's a fact. I think after reading this one, we have read all of her Star Wars novels. Yep. So that's part of the game plan is to go through these novels first and then uh, branch off from there. So that's that's the first thing you need to know about the High Republic Into the Dark is that we were both fans. Uh, there are many different fractured aspects of the Star Wars fan base these, these days. Um, scathing criticism is not what you're going to get from this podcast. Absolutely so, not. We, we are really enjoying the ride um, and trying to map out a timeline for ourselves and for our listeners. Uh, and we're really excited about the, the High Republic period, which, mm -hmm. you know, this is one of the Vanguard texts of. Uh, this was just announced last year, and these books just came out for the first time this year. And they're piloting the High Republic in novels and comics. And then they also just uh, announced that the first High Republic show is going to be made called The Acolyte. I'm um, really excited about that. I am too. And Sarah and I just finished uh, Russian Doll, which the, the person who created the show Russian Doll is the one in charge of The Acolyte. So the High Republic period is several hundred years before the timeline of Star Wars that we all know now in the films and TV shows. Uh, the only character that would be alive in these storylines that we are familiar with is Yoda. And we only get a few allusions to Yoda in this story. So we have uh, a totally new cast of characters, but they are rich and well-developed uh, as characters in the way that we expect from our, our Star Wars stories. Um, and we have two different groups. We have a Rough Around the Edges crew uh, of a semi-smuggler vessel. I guess it's a totally smuggler vessel. Love it. I do too. Uh, and then we also have this um, coterie of Jedi that are being transported on the vessel. And the Jedi, the main character of our story, is named Reef, Reef Silas. And the other Jedi are um, Masters Orla Jereni and Comac Vitus, whom I really enjoyed. And I want to get into their characters as we go through uh this. I love uh, it. So, yeah. Go ahead. So, Comac Vitus, I think that you and I both mutually texted each other whenever the character of Comac Vitus was introduced. So, what, what you need to know about Comac is he almost reminds me, disposition wise, of a kind of Qui Gon Jinn type Jedi. A Jedi who who isn't all about the rules. He exists, mm -hmm. he exists within the rules but he won't necessarily follow them. You know, the whole controversy of, of Qui-Gon wanting to instruct Anakin, even though the Jedi Council didn't want him to. So sort of that, almost a Jedi bad boy. Um, but the reason we were texting each other is because we determined that Comac Vitus has possibly one of the coolest jobs in the Jedi Order, and his responsibility is to pretty much gather data and intel on other cultures and their folk tales. So he's a folklorist. Um, Ryan and I like to think of ourselves as the Comac Vitus of the Star Wars podcast 
Comic Vitasi of the Star Wars <laughs> podcast universe because we're collecting the folk tales of all of these different Star Wars societies. But he he's such a good character, and I feel like he, more than any Jedi that I've read, at least, has so openly questioned the the tenets mm-hmm. of the Jedi Order, um, and 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 the you know the idea of do we have a dark side and a light side, and are is it appropriate for them to be separate? And I'm sure we'll get into this later, but he really embodies this idea, at least in his mind, of the gray Jedi. Um, but I mean, what did you like about Comac? Well, uh, first off, I liked his his golden robe. Oh, I thought yeah. that was a pretty solid choice. Um, Comac seemed to be a Jedi Master um, that was able to balance multiple oppositions in his life. Mm-hmm. So on the one hand, he's a scholar um, who's traveling the galaxy and collecting folklore. On the other hand, he's described in the first sentence that we meet him as a mystic. And mm-hmm. we see his mystic attitude um multiple times including in in his ability to levitate while he meditates um and in that moment of meditating we we kind of get some of the thought process of how he allows himself Mm -hmm. to do this and he says that he pushes past the illusory reality that surrounds him i love that i do too and and this is one of those things that claudia gray does is just drops these uh, it's not even a plot point. It's just a um, a descriptor in there to kind of contextualize the philosophy that they're working from. Um, so Comac is able to balance in that way. He also, um, I think he is a gray Jedi in one way, and then I think that Orla Jirini, uh is a gray Jedi in a different way. And I guess we can get yeah. into this later, um, but yeah, or, yeah, or now, <laughs> it, it, oh, later or now, because I mean, I, I feel like this is it's also a good way to introduce a couple other Jedi that mm-hmm. we we don't really know a lot about, but I feel like they're they're important. You know, we have, as you said, we have two narratives that are going on in the story. We have the contemporaneous narrative, um, and then the twenty five years prior right. narrative. And in the 25 years prior narrative, it's Orla Jereni and, um, and, and Comac Vitus who mm-hmm. are the, the Padawans mm-hmm. um, in that story. So in the contemporaneous timeline, they're the Jedi Masters. But then in this 25 years prior, they're actually the Padawans. And their two Jedi Masters are present, Larret, um, Sovereil, and Simix. I couldn't find any name other than Simix, which I, I like. Simix too, yeah. If if I were a Jedi, I would want to be known by just one name. <laughs> it's, it's like it's like Cher, if Cher yeah, or were Madonna, a Jedi, or <laughs> Prince. But um, but the the great thing about that twenty five years ago story and seeing how they behaved, um, how Orla and Comac kind of behaved and what their ideology was at that stage, is you can kind of see that they act as really good. I don't want to say foils because they tend mm-hmm. to agree on a lot of things, but you can really see that two Jedi kind of under the same type of teaching, how you can really have two different types of personalities coming through. Mm-hmm. Because the one thing that I love about the High Republic era is, you know, the only Jedi information that we have, if you just watch the movies, is, okay, towards the end, the fall of the Galactic Republic. That's that's what you have in the prequels. And everyone is very rules oriented, very kind of I hesitate to use this word, but almost religious extremist with their approach to being a Jedi. Like this is our yeah. code. This is what we're doing. This is how we're going to do it. It's and a then, of focus course, on dogma. Yes. And then post order 66, everything is, you know, kind of thrown out the window and mm-hmm. it's, uh, you know, all just do what you can. Kind of a scrappy Jedi order sort of situation, if you can even call it an order at that point. But with the High Republic, we're kind of seeing, you know, this this whole idea of there are so many Jedi doing so many Jedi things that you almost have that freedom to think. It reminds me of of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, where mm-hmm. if you have these base ideas and base needs met and, you know, in a time like the High Republic, you did. You know, everyone was secure. Everyone was safe. Um 
so they had that ability to think on higher ideals. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like you get that in the High Republic, and it's fascinating to have those ideas out there in Star Wars because a lot of the ideas that that Claudia is exploring in these books, especially through the character of, of, of Comac, are things that, that nerds like us would have been talking about on Reddit or on message boards, just about... You know, I remember right when the, uh, you know, when when the Last Jedi came out, when Rise of Skywalker came out, everyone was talking about. I think the Last Jedi is going to be about Luke becoming more of a gray Jedi, and they're going to talk more about this and talk more about that. And so I just love that Claudia is adding this, and this is a little bit of a spoiler for the last part of our conversation. But that's one of the big things that this novel does for Star Wars as a whole, is it expands the idea of the do's and don'ts for a Jedi. Um, it makes it almost seem like Qui-Gon, he may have been the odd man out, you know, in the prequels at that right. phase of the Jedi Order, but it was almost commonplace it, to question and to, to feel like even as a master, you can question. But, uh, but yeah. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. And uh, I, I think that's part of the mission here is just to kind of show that diversity of Jedi. So even Wreath and Dez have two different dispositions than uh, Comac and Orla. But yeah. back to uh, Comac and Orla are both visionaries. They're, they are both mystics. Mm -hmm. And in the course of this book, they experience visions. Uh, and they place importance on those visions. And when we look at the prequels, at the, the era of decadence in the Republic, uh, we see that uh, the Jedi Order has systematized mm -hmm. almost to a point where they factor out that what, what Qui-Gon calls the um, experience of the living force. Mm -hmm. And and we see both uh, Comac and Orla kind of, well, I guess I don't want to get ahead of ourselves, but, but we see them having that experience of the living force. Or uh, mm -hmm. in my mind, that's the, the vital aspect of religion is the religious experience that mm -hmm. that leads into devotion um it, some people just come for like the system of social control and i think that's what we see in the prequel trilogy but right now we're, we're getting portrayals of that experience of the lived religion and i think yes, that's it's neat. yeah it's and that's kind of the important thing to understand is at this stage in star wars uh, in like 2021 stage mm -hmm. in Star Wars, we've been given perhaps the most explicit description of what the Jedi are and what the Force is and how, right. you know, this whole idea that the Jedi do not have a monopoly over the Force. The Force right. is something yeah. available to everyone, just like, you know, from in, in the Christian tradition, you know, salvation and a holy spirit is accessible to everyone not just these chosen few and you know that's that's just between you know the idea of of jedi as a religion as luke explicitly says you know mm -hmm. he actually refers to it as the jedi religion and then i was uh, i was doing some research on the high republic period as distinguishable from the old republic period. Mm -hmm. You know, the older public actually started, I think, 25,000 years before the Battle of Yavin. So this is like way back there. Yeah. Whereas I think, you know, like you said, the High Republic, I believe it was from 300 uh, BBY to like 82 BBY or something like that. Um, but it, it's, it's just this, this, this whole idea that if you, if you get on Wikipedia, which is unimpeachable, by the way, for those of you who don't know about Wikipedia, it is the greatest but if you get on Wikipedia, it actually refers to the Jedi as the unofficial religion of the Republic, mm -hmm. which is just mind blowing to me um, to think about it as a religion instead of, you know, like a, a, an, an order of monks or um, or or something like that. I think in the book, I can't remember who describes them the Jedi as this, but doesn't someone say um, wizard monk? They describe the yeah, Jedi as yeah. wizard monks. I think it was Leox, who's our oh. uh, resident spice smoker and oh yeah, <laughs> and yeah. all time good time Charlie. I <laughs> all around I really, good time Charlie. I was I was this close, and for those of you that can't see, I have a a, a, a tiny very space close between folks. very close to texting you and saying do you want to rename the podcast uh the wizard monk <laughs> the wizard i monk like that book club 
yeah, but it, I, uh, add in samurai and the, <laughs> and you got it <laughs> i love it so much but um but 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 no it's 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 interesting because especially when you consider Je- you know the jedi order as being a a type of religious order mm-hmm. then you have these characters like comac um and and orla who are almost like the Martin Luthers in the system, who are questioning hmm. the way things are, who are who are trying to see if there is a better way to go about it. And it makes me wonder and if, if in the future, maybe in the far future of the franchise and of the series, we're going to see, I mean, we already see it with the Sith, but this whole idea of, of people interpreting what the Force means differently and therefore splitting mm-hmm. off much like you know, the early Roman Catholic Church ended up splitting off into, you know, the, 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 the Catholic tradition and then the Protestant tradition and then the Protestant tradition split off into a whole bunch of different denominations that, you know, still believe in, quote unquote, the force, but believe it's 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 used and applicable and accessed in different ways. But I mean, well, yeah, I, I, I dig that. And I think, you know, if you think about that, if you go even a click further back, you have all of the different mystery cults of Christianity mm-hmm. that galvanized into the Christian faith. And so that could be what they're exploring as well. The Gnostic Christian mm-hmm. texts that have been rediscovered uh, provide a very different perspective on mm-hmm. the events um, of the Gospels than uh, the canonized Gospels. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, also while you were talking we were talking about the Holy Spirit. I was thinking there's there's an equivalent there in like Buddha nature, in mm-hmm. Buddhism, and so I think across the world religions there are these types of equivalents, mm-hmm. or these these universal it. moments. Yeah, and and, and, and yeah, I if tend anything, to think. Oh, go ahead. No, you tend to think. Well, go ahead. Sorry. I tend to think about uh, Jedi masters as uh, Taoist masters. I like and it. And some more than others. So we've we've talked a lot about Obi-Wan Kenobi and his hero's journey, which is a schema we'll get into later, but mm. how he goes from this rigidly dogmatic Jedi Knight into someone who is more of Qui-Gon's disposition mm-hmm. and recognizing the flow of the living force. Um, someone like Mace Windu is really interesting to me. Yeah. yeah. Because he and Yoda, like, Yoda seems to be on this totally Taoish side of it, and Mace mm-hmm. Windu seems to think much more concretely and yeah. um, uh, systematically. But the two mm-hmm. of them worked really well together. Uh, what, what I see with Comac and Orla uh, are, are people that are chafing against this kind of concretization of the Jedi dogma as it's establishing itself uh, and they're both going in their own directions and I and it, for different reasons too so Orla Orla's reason for wanting to leave the Jedi or not leave the Jedi order she becomes uh, what they call a wayfinder which is or way seeker really cool idea it's a solitary Jedi um, that traverses the galaxy doing good wherever they can it makes me think of like the rogue samurai yeah they're like the ronin or the yeah. or the the knight errant yes it's it's just this is this is another thing so i feel like the more you all listen to this show the more you're going to be able to identify the moments when when if you're reading along when ryan and i would have texted each other so comac as a folklorist was, was <laughs> one of them but I think the other one was this concept of a way seeker yeah. where it's almost for those of you that are Harry Potter fans, it's it's it, I got the same feeling that I got when I heard about what an auror was. And, you know, I mean, after after the fact, people are like, oh, it's just a, it's just a wizard cop. But it's this idea of a wizard whose only purpose is to seek out, you know, trouble and, and fix it and solve it like almost a Doctor Who type thing. But the idea of a way seeker it's so cool. It's almost like a, I don't want to say a gun for hire because that's not necessarily what it is, but it's almost like a U.S. Marshal, but a Jedi. And that's just so cool. And I, uh, I really appreciated this. Again, thank you, Wikipedia. The idea that Wayseekers had been known to undergo solitary meditation on mountaintops 
and assist revolutionaries against planetary tyrants, which, again, it's so fascinating to see these ideas during the High Republic era because, you know, the big tension in the prequels is that the Jedi, you know, were supposed to just be peacekeepers. They weren't supposed to be doing all this other stuff. And it almost seems like at a certain point, they all were almost forced to become way seekers, you know, acting as as general, you know, General Kenobi, mm-hmm. General Skywalker in the Clone Wars, and which ultimately led to kind of the schism and the downfall of, of the Jedi Order and the hubris is this idea that they're stretching themselves really thin. And it's neat to see, you know, this this rank of the Jedi Order where that was encouraged mm-hmm. um, as a way seeker. But is this I think this is the is this a Claudia Gray invention? But I, I think so. But it also strikes me as an explanation of Ahsoka's path. Yes. Yes. It, when we no. see her show up in Mandalorian, it, it mm-hmm. seems to vibe very well with this description of a way seeker. And if, if you if you take her path specifically into consideration, it kind of shows how stringent the Jedi Order had become. At the mm-hmm. time that, for those of you who have seen the Clone Wars, when Ahsoka is basically put on trial and mm-hmm. then is no longer Wrongly in the Jedi accused. Order, yeah, she's she's she was it was rigged, it was rigged. She did oh she boy. Didn't do anything wrong, <laughs> and she. Uh, but she. We just lost sorry. half of our listener base. <laughs> Try, trying to keep the podcast evergreen. Good job, Dylan. That was what I was going to mention earlier. But um, but she uh, she's you know she's wrongfully accused. She's she's gone. She's no longer in the Jedi Order. And she she ends up doing something that that comes naturally to her, which is she becomes a type of way seeker. We see her, mm-hmm. you know, show up again in, in Rebels. And then, of course, famously, we see her show up uh, live action in The Mandalorian. And now we're going to see her show up in her own TV show, which right. I, you know, if, if you look at The Mandalorian kind of as the bounty hunter show, like the Wild West gunslinger kind of show, I I would look at the Ahsoka show as the knight errant, the way seeker, the Ronin kind of thing. Um, but but I just looked it up, and Claudia Gray, the first appearance of a way seeker, was in the High Republic Into the Dark. Fantastic. So this is why these novels are are so fun to read, and why it's so helpful. Because now you know that the concept of the Wayseeker exists in the Star Wars canon, and you might be able to see that in further shows and in further TV, sh- you know, movies. But right, well, those, and yeah. with with Ahsoka, uh, mm-hmm. once she deviates from the Jedi path to go on her own path, which is something that we exactly what we see happen with Orla here, she has the two white lightsabers, mm-hmm. and Orla's lightsaber i think is like the darth mar darth maul style oh yeah uh but it's a double bladed white lightsaber in star wars it's important to note that at depending on what you read i guess lightsaber colors mean something Mm -hmm. um you have you have you know the yellow lightsaber which is the color that the you know jedi temple guards who would you know with their with their yellow lightsaber pikes would guard uh, the, you know, Ray has one of those at the end of the Rise of Skywalker, which could be an allusion to the fact that she's now the quote unquote guardian of the Jedi Order. Ooh, that's but, good. But then you also—I I think I read that online. I will not take credit for okay. it. I give credit to <laughs> to a Reddit user, uh, uh, four twenty Darth Maul boy, or something like that. <laughs> but uh, but we—it almost makes you wonder, you know, if if Orla has a white lightsaber and Ahsoka has a white lightsaber, if that's almost like. The Wayseeker color, which makes me kind of really want a white lightsaber. We are going to talk about the crystals a little bit more when we get mm-hmm. to Master and Apprentice, which is another thing that Claudia Gray adds to Star Wars. Is mm-hmm. um, So in canon now, the crystals are not colored whenever the Jedi goes on their temple quest to pick the crystal. The crystal as it vibes with the Jedi that's that's using the saber, it chooses a color. Mm-hmm. According to Claudia Gray in a different one of these books, which is canon. So I don't I don't know how the lightsabers go white. Does the mm-hmm. crystal switch color? Was it a different color before? We've seen mm-hmm. Ahsoka with a yellow lightsaber, a green lightsaber. Uh-huh. 
Uh, now they're white. Oh, that's now not, I never white. I never thought about that. It almost makes me. This sounds like I'm being I'm being flippant, but I'm not. It almost makes me wonder if I was very indecisive when I played through uh, Jedi Fallen Order, mm-hmm. and I would constantly change the color of my lightsaber because yeah. <laughs> I was I was blue for a while, but then I was like, no, I want something cooler. And it almost makes me wonder if over time, kind of like you said, a Jedi's lightsaber can change. Like if um, if for example, if Kylo Ren had kept his original lightsaber when Luke was training him, mm-hmm. would it have changed from blue to red as he became more and more influenced by Snoke, um, nay Palpatine? But man, that's a fascinating question. And these these are all questions that I believe not just in Master and Apprentice and Claudia Gray. I feel like these are questions that are going to constantly come back up as we read through these novels. I but think that's so a, too. But I love it. So. We have our Jedi. That's kind of yes. our first group. And so when we, when we first, and correct me if I'm wrong, when we first kind of meet Wreath and uh, Wreath's Jedi Master, Jorah Mali, um, Wreath is kind of not super excited. He's a research guy. He likes to stay in the Jedi archives and look stuff up. And he's he's kind of like the opposite of Comac. Comac likes to research, but he likes to go places to research. Whereas, right. you know, Wreath is almost like the Jedi house cat. He likes to you know hang out and uh, and get all of his stuff done. I think Comac, with with the benefit of hindsight, I think that Comac shows us the type of Jedi that Reef can grow into. Yeah. But Reef is at Ooh. the beginning of his journey and. Quite frankly, Comac's at the beginning of his journey too, because mm-hmm. there's never a beginning and an end of the journey. It's a, a circle. It's a, a wheel that's always rolling forward. Uh, but we see, we meet Reef, and he's deep in his carol, his research carol in the Jedi archive, and that's where he likes to be. That's where he feels comfortable and safe. He does not put himself out there. He does not want to go on adventures. Um, he is. Uh, you know, I'm I'm reminded of a Ralph Waldo Emerson quote: uh, "Meek young men grow up in libraries." Mm. Emerson is always relevant. Let's see. Emerson is always relevant. Meek young men grow up in libraries, believing it their duty to accept the views which Cicero, which Locke, which Bacon have given, forgetful that Cicero, Locke, and Bacon were only young men in libraries when they wrote those books. Oh. I love and, that. And that that's Reith. It's Reith. Yeah. And but when he meets Comac, you know, and as soon as they describe him as this wandering folklorist, it mm-hmm. it you get that parallel between where Reef it Reith is and where where Comac is and mm-hmm. we we can kind of see that Reith could develop into this type of figure within the Jedi order if he has oh, yeah. the right push. Um so you know, no spoilers for the end of the book yet. We we've been really bad about getting the plot out there. <laughs> <laughs> we're doing it, we're doing it naturally, and the way I see it is is for people for people who are reading along, they're following it. And for people who aren't, I mean, sorry guys, this is our first episode. For people who aren't, you have been introduced to all these Jedi. Yes, uh, and so the story that occurs is these Jedi are going out into the frontier um what's what's the name of the base called that they're going to so the starlight beacon the Um, starlight beacon that was the plan originally right so right the situation is that that jorah who is of course wreath's jedi master is heading to the starlight beacon and then wreath is going to follow her there and wreath of course is upset um, he, he doesn't understand why he needs to go to the frontier. As we said, he's just happier staying in the Jedi archives and just reading and researching. But uh, Jorah goes, and then he ends up hitching a ride and heading to the Starlight Beacon as well, along with Dez, Orla, and Comac, and the rest of the crew of the aptly named Vessel. Um, we have Leox, uh, Giasi, Affy Hollow, <laughs> and Geode, my favorite character in all of Star Wars. But so you kind of already talked about about Leox, kind of like the resident, uh, the spice head, um, basically Matthew he, McConaughey. Yeah. So um, about half of this book I listened to on an audiobook, and the narrator 
used a Matthew McConaughey voice for <laughs> Leox, and it <laughs> you could you could almost hear the all right, all right, all right. <laughs> oh, and so Leox is. I mean, he's pretty much the 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 captain, the quote unquote leader. Right. But but Affy Hollow, who is a a a young woman. This is act, so technically this is a young adult book, which kind of a fun side note. The designation of a book as young adult doesn't mean its reading level is young adult. It just means that the characters in the book are young adults. I just learned that recently. I didn't know so that. That's your fun fact. So all of the characters except for Leox and the Jedi Masters, and I'm assuming Geode, are, uh, are young adults. Um, but Affy is the adopted daughter of the, I guess, the, the leader of the Bind Guild. Guild. Yeah. Bind Guild. See, this is why Bind you Guild. do the audiobook, and I just I read along. But the Bind Guild is is I don't even know how would you describe the Bind Guild? It's it's like a shipping syndicate mm-hmm. that has a CD underbelly that gets exposed. Yes. Um, that the Bind Guild. First off, uh, we find out pretty quickly that um, they're smugglers. They're they're smuggling mm-hmm. spice, mm-hmm. which is another reason why. Whenever I started reading this and thinking, you know, this is a YA book, um, it makes a lot more sense now that it's just that the characters are young adults uh, mm-hmm. because there's there's a lot of spice use, which is something that we are going to talk about. But it's the the drug in the mm-hmm. Star Wars galaxy. Uh, there's conversation about sex um, and all these things that I did not expect to find in a YA novel. <laughs> yeah, big big questions are asked and answered yeah. in this book about concepts and ideas that we've always wondered about uh, when it comes to the Jedi Order. But so, right. and also, I feel like, oh gosh, we got, okay, we got to talk about Geode. It's literally a rock, or excuse me, he oh, man. is a rock. Geode, and, and as you texted me, <laughs> Geode rocks. <laughs> Ge- Geode, he Geode just is a rocks. man. Uh, the way that Geode is written, it was just it delighted me at mm-hmm. every turn because he's he's apparently a sentient being that is just a rock, and he's actually the navigator of the vessel, <laughs> but he never moves. Oh. We we see him show up in different places, but we never see him move. We never hear him talk. In fact, Leox tells us um, his real name is unpronounceable if you have a mouth (laughs) (laughs) but but whenever they need him he's always there um you know the bob seger song like a rock is (laughs) playing in my head now Um, he really he's he's the most reliable character who we literally we never see him move no we we never hear him speak but he is and I mean, I, I will I will go ahead and say that that we will I am going to kind of spoil the end a little bit here, but he ends up being like the savior, yeah. At the end of this, at the end of this of this book, when it's Wreath, I think, who is in trouble, isn't he? Getting sucked in out into sucked space, sucked out of an airlock, yeah, and, yeah, and, and <laughs> but he hits this solid <laughs> surface, He's and like, it's what Geode, did I it's Geode, and he has oh. glued himself to the ground in front of the airlock and saved. Wreath's life. Oh, okay, man. but to he get is... there, mm-hmm. I'm going to try to get through this plot really quickly. So we have a you. lot of different storylines. So we have all of these characters meet up, and they are going out to the Starlight Beacon. But there is a massive disaster in the hyperspace lane, and all of these ships get thrown out of the hyperspace lane, and they uh, are close to a star... And there is a, uh, a, would you call it a base? Yeah, some some kind of, I mean, it's it's truly just a space station, like an abandoned it's a space station. Yeah, space station. And, and uh, from the Amaxine Warriors. Yes, and you know they walk in there, and it's it's basically like almost a, a giant ter not a, not a terrarium, or is that the yeah, right word? It's I think just, so. It's like it's a Marriott. jungle. Gardens. It's a botanical garden. Yeah, it's a it's a, a jungle in space. Yeah, yeah. It reminds in a big me of greenhouse. Yeah. Did you watch uh, HBO's Watchmen? That TV show. Ooh, yeah. 
it reminds me of how in, you know the incredible incredibly futuristic building i forget the character's right. name and i don't want to say who it is because the only way i know her is by a spoiler mm. um but but so this 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 just gorgeous um and an incredibly like rainforest like rainforest cafe vibes is what i'm trying to yeah, say or like a, a biodome Yes, and which is also an amazing movie. It's a great movie. <laughs> great movie. That's what we're going to talk about next week on the. <laughs> yes, we're not talking about Claudia Gray. We're talking about the hit '90s film Biodome. Yep. But um, <laughs> but but yeah. So it's it's basically it's abandoned except for all of these plants and the robots taking care of the plants. I loved these robots. Were they called the T ones? I like them I think, too. Or the eight Ts. So eight Ts. Eight Ts. Yeah. Eight T yeah. gardening droids that wouldn't bother you unless you were um, messing with the plants. So right. I like to think I think they were described as like the top half of an astromech droid. So right. almost I get the vibe of uh, Alpha Five from Power Rangers, like that sort of head but floating around, and they wouldn't mess with you unless you messed with the plants and. So, I mean, first of all, that has a video game quest all over it. Like, you know, deliver this without stepping on the plants. But all about when they ar- it. yeah, when they arrive um, to escape the debris um, because they've shut down all of the uh, all of the light speed, uh, what is it? Light speed terminals. The, like the, the hyperspace yeah. uh, lanes. The hy- yeah. So, first of all, that's a fascinating idea is that mm-hmm. You know, when I think of hyperspace, I I just kind of think, oh, it's space, it's massive, people can just go wherever they want. But it's almost like the same way that airplanes have to always know, Mm -hmm. like, this plane's at this altitude, at this trajectory, at this speed. And so we have that same thing in in this novel, where the hyperspace lane that is going, I guess, from Coruscant to the Starlight Beacon Mm -hmm. is something's, there's a crash, and it shuts down everything and people aren't allowed to travel that way. So that's what gets our Jedi and our intrepid crew of the vessel stuck on this space station. Right. So, so everybody's pulled out of hyperspace at the same point, but it's, I believe it's a dying star and it's Mm -hmm. shooting out these um, flares, these solar flares. And so the Jedi coordinate a rescue mission where they get all of these vessels of dissimilar people to go to the terrarium space station. But as soon as they walk in, they feel a powerful evil. And, 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 and then it just really hits the fan because we have a lot of like raiders and, Mm -hmm. uh, just general scum and villainy have been invited onto the space station um, at the same time that the Jedi are trying to investigate where the hell this dark power is coming from, and they can't find out. They can't figure it out. Mm-hmm. And at about this point, we start getting these flashbacks, and we get a series of six flashbacks to 25 years earlier, and it's the story of Orla and Comac as Padawans for... Uh, Master Lara is Orla's master, and Simix is Comac's master. And they had been sent on a mission 25 years earlier um, to uh, a, a, a planet or a moon that was held in position between two like planetoids, Irum and Arano. That's so cool. By the way, I'm just it I'm is. imagining it's, like this delicate ballet of gravitational right. fields just holding this moon in place. I'd love to see it on the screen. Oh, it, it would be awesome. That, so that that is something that you want to understand about Claudia as a writer is I feel like any one of her novels would be an amazing Star Wars movie or a Star Wars like miniseries. I'm all about miniseries oh, yeah. right now. So like an amazing oh, Star Wars yeah. miniseries. But so you actually you did a really good job, much better than I did, of the twenty five years prior story. So we have the two Padawans um, mm-hmm. who are on this mission with their masters. We have um, some kidnapped leadership, 
And if I remember mm-hmm. correctly, and, and if I don't, I will cut this out. But if I'm right, then you all will know that I cut out stuff when I'm wrong to make sure I sound like I'm right. But <laughs> aren't, the, aren't the leaders that were kidnapped the leaders of those two planetoids? Yes, sir. And, and they're, I can't remember the guy's name who kidnapped them. But... Uh, his name is uh, Isomer, and he is a Lasat. So Isomer the Lasat captures these two leaders from these two planetoids and brings them to the moon, which I thought was really thoughtful of him. So none of the rescue <laughs> parties had to travel far from each planet. Um, but what a uh, guy! <laughs> but yeah, it's, if you're gonna get kidnapped, get kidnapped by by this specific Lasat. But yeah. so I can't remember the way you put it, but you put it better than I did. But you know, my whole thing was. Whenever I, I get a flashback in anything, I always am like, okay, what's what's the purpose? How is this going to inform my reading of what, what else is happening? But I can't remember the way you put it, but what would you say kind of the big I, the big point of that flashback was? You know, first and foremost, you see mm-hmm. that these two leaders, they don't like each other. Um, these two planetoids are not fans of each other. And by mm-hmm. virtue of being captured together, um, and spending that time together, they actually learn to understand one another. And right. th- although they, you know, aren't super best friends by the time it's all done, I, I feel like the lesson that that I took from that flashback is the whole idea that you can have two people with completely opposing views um, from two different walks of life, and they can understand each other if they just listen because that's something right. that we get with the Jedi. Um, that's, you know, that's the lesson that we learn uh, that Orla and, and Comac learn that they are then trying to impart to the young Padawans who are on this, this, uh, this rainforest cafe space station, which I'm now going to call it. Um, but I mean, did, is <laughs> can, there can we get margaritas? <laughs> yes, uh, man. I love this bar and space station, but <laughs> that's but, even better. <laughs> but are you, uh, I mean, is there anything else about this 25 years ago that, that, that you think is, is worth mentioning for purposes of understanding this novel? Yes. I, I think you did a great job. And, uh, so we get these two leaders who are Monarch Castle, from Arano and Queen Thandeka from Irum. Uh, but our Lasat Isomer is pissed off because his minions have uh, kidnapped the wrong queen. The actual ruler of Irum is Queen Dima, and Queen Thandeka is Queen Dima's wife. Uh, but they still have this type of Castle and Thandeka have the animosity for each other that, to my mind, uh, it parallels the echo chamber. You know, Mm. the the echo chambers that sometimes society falls into um, and we feed our confirmation bias and we are dividing ourselves. And we have these two planets that are separate and they're Mm. brought into this common space. They're and they're shackled together. And in that common space, they they develop their empathy for each other mm-hmm. so much so that whenever the jedi finally rescue uh or they finally break through to rescue the rulers monarch castle uh takes a bullet for queen thandeka mm-hmm. and queen thandeka then eventually galvanizes the people of both planets together uh so i thought there is a kind of a parable there it was a little moralistic um but then the the other really important thread of that 25 years earlier um storyline was it planted the seed of the types of rebellion that both orla and comac feel so Mm -hmm. uh the isomer who has been hired by the huts of course, those dastardly huts. 
<laughs> the huts are everywhere, man. <laughs> McClunky. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so you got we got to get one McClunky in every episode. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's like our severed limb. In every episode yeah. of Star Wars, you have a severed limb. In every episode of this podcast, one of us has to say McClunky. You know, and I, I think didn't we consider naming the podcast McClunky? Did we not? I yes, we did. We, we, did. Um, we we ap- we absolutely did. And fun fact for those of you who are wondering, McClunky is an actual word in Hutties, and it means you will not survive this. It actually shows up twice in Star Wars. It shows up in the Disney Plus version of A New Hope, and it shows up uh, in Episode One when Sebulba gets uh, gets really mad at Jar Jar and tries to fight him, and Anakin saves him. And, you know, Anakin is talking trash about the Boon to Eve classic. And Sebulba goes, Maklanki, Ado Skywalker, or something like that. He's like, you're not going to survive the Boon to Eve, bro. But guess what, Sebulba? You're not as good at pod racing as you thought you were. Ice cold. I'm throwing shade <laughs> at you, Sebulba. Uh, Come at me, so Sebulba. There's a third McClunky now. Ooh. In the, uh, doesn't Bib Fortuna say McClunky <gasps> at, in right. The Mandalorian? Yeah. Oh, he does. He says it at the. Uh, it's it's the at the, the the post the when post Finnick, credit stinger. Yeah. Oh my gosh! Which makes me excited for the book of Boba Fett. Now, okay. It, it makes me want to do like a a Pee Wee's Fun House word of the day, where every time someone in Star Wars says McClunky, you know, streamers drop and we all go crazy. <laughs> McClunky is the new um, Wilhelm scream for me oh. i've decided That's, okay <laughs> i want it to show up in other media like if i hear a mcclunky in like the new indiana jones movie i'm gonna lose it i'm gonna absolutely lose it mm. uh so back to the plot um so <laughs> comac comac's master is simix and he dies in the crash because their vessel is shot down when they're approaching this this moon between the planetoids um, and Simix passes away, and we see the first um, element of Comac's discontent with the Jedi Order there, because mm-hmm. he f- is caught in between wanting to grieve for someone that he had a personal connection with, and the dogma of the Jedi telling him that it's inappropriate to grieve, which is mm-hmm. something that we see reinforced by Yoda later in um mm-hmm episode two um, yeah more not for those who oh boy i can't remember yeah, it verbatim so it, it, the idea that yoda not. yeah more than do not miss them do not we're supposed right. to celebrate you know the jedi that pass on to the force right um which uh, i mean that's that's one of the things i think that really brings together um comac and and wreath because what we come to find out is that Jora, Wreath's Jedi Master, also dies. And so mm-hmm. Comac sees, and she dies on the Starlight Beacon, I believe, or on the way mm-hmm. to the Starlight mm-hmm. Beacon. So it's very similar circumstances. And so that's a lot of the tension with Orla and Comac is Orla, mm-hmm. having experienced that with Comac, knows kind of what he's feeling and kind of that, that pull to the quote-unquote dark side that Comac could be feeling. But in that same regard, Comac can see and use that experience to teach Wreath um, kind of what it means to mourn if mourning is a bad thing. And I don't know if this is the appropriate place to do this, but the questions that are asked about the Jedi Order and their approach to things, as trivial as it sounds, I feel like the conversation about mourning and the conversation about sex in this book are very similar because... You know, we're we're supposed to like like you said and like Yoda said, we're supposed to celebrate those that pass into the force. But that doesn't answer our question of, well, then what are these feelings of grief? And the same thing can be said, you know, up until this point, I thought that Jedi uh, were celibate, that it was like a monkish existence. We find out that it's it's not. That's not the case. You right. know, sex is not prohibited, but right. attachment, attachment is. Attachment, yeah. Exactly. It brings up this point that that you know it's it's I don't even know how to say this. It's bizarre because especially with the, the the sex versus attachment thing, in almost every other religious tradition and in many ways in the Jedi Order, we're not supposed to keep 
our 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 hearts set and our and our brains focused on on things of this world, things of the physical mm-hmm. world. You know, Yoda says, "Luminous beings are we, not mm-hmm. this base matter." Yet the ideas that the Jedi cling to are: you can enjoy the base matter, but just make sure it doesn't affect your 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 luminosity, which right. is it seems counterintuitive, such that I can understand why Comac would begin to question it. Um, and it's this whole idea of, you know, do you, f- if you follow the Jedi code to a T, you are a living contradiction in many ways. Um, but, you know, like I said, I feel like the, the, the sex talk and <laughs> the sex talk, the birds and the bees of the Jedi and, um, and the, the, the conversation about mourning really walk hand in hand because it shows that. Jedi teachings aren't in, aren't you know infallible. Um, Absolutely, which, which which is something that that also again connects to a lot of these other religious ideas that you know you have, you have, in the I I will always cite the Christian tradition because that's the one that I'm most aware of and and a, and a member of. It's this idea that you know God is infallible. But man is fallible. So things like the Bible could be fallible. Men's interpretation of it could be fallible. And it makes me wonder, you know, the, the Jedi are, are very fallible. We, we know that. We see that by virtue of the fact they were all wiped out. They couldn't see it. Order 66. The Jedi are fallible. But it makes me wonder, is the infallibility in the Star Wars universe just simply the force itself? I think so. And the, you know, we get some more description of that. This is why Qui-Gon Jinn was such a great addition to the Mm. Star Wars galaxy and Mm. his conversation with Obi-Wan about um, paying attention to the living force and kind of the flow of the force. It's very, I keep saying Mm Taoish. So I think it it takes its cues from Tao, Taoism. Um, It's not necessarily the Tao, but he is offering an alternative to that rigid dogmatic approach that takes the living out of life yes. so to speak if you're if you are um regulating uh partying or grief or mm-hmm. sexual attraction any of these emotions because we're so scared of going to the dark side well there's another emotion yep right the, about fear that dark is side. the path so, to the dark fear side. is the path to the dark side right um i have a couple of places i'd like to go here one okay. is that there is a jedi jedi party that shows up and mm-hmm. i think this fits in the theme of what you're talking about mm-hmm. and claudia gray gives us a quote she says that re drink certain beverages that were not technically forbidden a small measure of indulgence wasn't necessarily a bad thing Mm-hmm. If it, and then this is no longer a direct quote, but if it promotes unity and harmony. And so mm-hmm. I think like that kind of intoxication impulse fits in with what would be regulated by a, a dogmatic set of instructions. Um, and then ultimately, Master Comac is stepping back from the order because this is in chapter 26. He says to Wreath, the darkness is as much a part of the force as the light. The Order mm-hmm. thinks it can bisect the Force so neatly as though the primal living energy of all existence were a thing to be sliced and served. Yeah. And he goes on to talk about how trying to ignore the dark could make the dark that much darker. I love and that. And I, to me, that... That sent up the hair on the back of my neck thinking about Anakin. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's... And I, I feel like I feel like I'm kind of doing Claudia a disservice here because I, I feel like we could truly have an entire episode and we might have like a, a random bonus episode in the future where we just pick out, you know, our 10 favorite quotes from, you know, from Claudia's novels. Because... Oh, that's great. You know, it's not just the Jedi, but, you know, I going through my notes when I was preparing for this episode, you know, you just run into stuff like 
there's this there's this part in the novel where we get a lot of the Leox um, mm-hmm. point of view sort of sections. And, you know, on the surface, he's the, all right, all right, all right. We're going to have some spice. We're going to enjoy our spice. And then we're just going to have fun. But then in chapter 12, you have this just this little section. And I'll, I'll read it directly out. It's Leox Giasi had seen some strange things in his day, enough that he tried not to use the word strange too often. And then this is the part that I focused in on. To the prepared mind, no element of the galaxy should seem alien. They were all the same star stuff, merely taking different shapes from time to time. And so... It's fantastic. I'm, I mean, the way that Claudia is 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 pushing this, this idea of... I don't even know how to describe it. Honestly, I just want an excuse to read that quote just because it's 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 what she does so well, which is she... She does, and this is going to probably lose us some listeners, but she does what I feel like Ryan Johnson did very well in The Last Jedi, and she she takes what we know about the Force and about the Jedi and about these ideals that exist in this universe and expands it. And that expansion doesn't refute anything we've heard earlier. It, it strengthens what we've heard earlier and what we've seen earlier. And amplifies. Um, oh, my gosh, yes. It... it like like a starlight beacon. She is our starlight Hey-o. beacon. Hey, we oh. got it. There we, we go. Need to, we need to at her with that we're one. Gonna, we're gonna, I'm going <laughs> to at you, Claudia. Um, you can at me back. It's not a don't at me situation. but um, It's a but please no. at me situation. <laughs> yeah, it's please. We would love to have you on this podcast, which is basically, we should have just been called the Claudia Gray Book Club. But... Um, <laughs> But so so kind of helping helping us move through the plot um, mm-hmm. now that we've kind of covered the big idea <laughs> now that we've already talked about sex and death. Um, we'll uh, can can I offer one more thing that no, please. I, I know it's out of order now, but mm-hmm. to go back to that, there's mm-hmm. there's a precedent in Taoism for this conversation of grief. Ooh, uh, And this is the Taoist master Zhuangzi. Okay. And that's Z H U A N G Z I. If anyone is interested, and there is a tale of Zhuangzi losing his wife when Zhuangzi's life, excuse me, when Zhuangzi, woo, when Zhuangzi's wife dies. Uh, another master comes to give his condolences, and he finds Zhuangzi sitting with his legs sprawled out pounding on a tub and singing you lived with her she brought up your children and grew old said the other master it should be enough simply not to weep at her death but pounding on a tub and singing this is going too far isn't it zwangzi said you're wrong when she first died do you think i didn't grieve like anyone else but i looked back at her beginning and the time before she was born Mm. not only the time before she was born but the time before she had a body not only the time before she had a body, but the time before she had a spirit. In the midst of the jumble of wonder and mystery, a change took place and she had a spirit. Another change and she had a body. Another change and she was born. Now there's been another change and she's dead. It's just like the progression of the four seasons, spring, summer, fall, and winter. Now she's going to lie down peacefully in a vast room, If I were to follow after her bawling and sobbing, it would show that I don't understand anything about fate. So I stopped. That's beautiful. That, and I mean, it, that's, it it reminds me of what Leox said, that we're all the same star stuff. We're all made of the same matter. It just changes from time to time. And I mean, that also kind of, it it speaks to the idea of, of the force and the idea of, you know, the growth and the death and the decay and how that's all right. part of the force. And so speaking on behalf of the Jedi, I guess, I understand that idea now why you shouldn't mourn. You know, there's the there's a quote in one of the 25 years ago sections of the book where mm-hmm. um, 
I'm sorry, Padawan, Vitus, your master is again at one with the force. And then it says, every tenant of the Jedi doctrine proclaimed that Comac should feel happy for Master Simics, who had been freed from the illusion of mortality and the weakness yes. of the flesh. Instead, Comac felt as though his guts had been torn out by a rancor's claws. And so kind of speaking on behalf that's of the Jedi. Aggro. Yeah, that's it's like, dude chill he's like that yeah. that's like the viking way to mourn that's it <laughs> um but it's, but it's emo comac oh oh yeah he put on he put on some hawthorne heights but it's this <laughs> it's this idea that i feel like the anger that a lot of these padawans and that, that you know that comac in that moment kind of feel is that i feel like it should be said that it's okay to mourn but don't let that mourning take over you it's it's Kind of yeah. like you read about with with you know, um, the party. Reith, yeah, Reith could party, he could drink, but right. everything in moderation. I right. mean, that's a tenet exactly. to so many different religious ideas. Is everything everything in in moderation? So even grief in moderation. You know, whenever I get and sad I, about this, sorry, go ahead. I want to hear what you were going to say. Oh, well, I was going to say whenever whenever I get upset about something or whenever I've had you know, twenty twenty was a year. Um, mm -hmm. as, as we all know, for many reasons and whenever something happened that was just devastating or, or, or something that made me angry or something, you know, like that, Leslie, uh, my, my wife, Leslie, for those of you who, who don't know Ryan or I, um, my wonderful wife's name is Leslie. Ryan's wonderful wife's name is Sarah. And Leslie is my Jedi master in more ways than one. She's much more wise than I am. But, but one thing that, that she and I have kind of instituted is I can be upset. I can be mad. I can I can cry. I can be angry, but twenty four hours, mm. and then know that nothing's going to change it. And we help each other through after we give ourselves that that moment, that time to just mm -hmm. let the emotions take over, and then understand that you know it's you know I'm a big practitioner and fan of stoicism and the idea of stoic thinking and marcus aurelius meditations and this whole idea that the only thing that we have control over in within this mortal coil is how we react to things and being angry and being upset and screaming and and crying that my jedi master is is dead and mourning him that does that does nothing for him that does nothing for the thing that's causing that problem. All it's doing is affecting me and my my soul, my my connection to the force. And I just that story. In case you didn't tell that 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 story that you just told, the Zen. What was his name again? One more time for the listeners. Zhuangzi. So the Zhuangzi story really really hit home um, for me, and especially after last year. So thank you for sharing it. By the way, of course. Well, and. The, the conversation that surrounds it, or the, the question is, did Zhuangzi make a mistake in grieving up front? Is he, is he fallible? Is he a master? Mm. Is he a master Taoist for forgetting that up front? Mm. And I think that's kind of what we see Claudia doing here. And mm. I'm going to take it back. Like you said, she is of the ilk of Dave Filoni who mm -hmm. has paid careful attention to this galaxy and um, created these loving depictions mm -hmm. that build on the foundation uh, that Lucas started. And mm -hmm. it seems in these different instances, in these different conversations, uh, set several hundred years before we see the too rigid dogma take over the mm -hmm. Jedi Order. We see her creating these characters that are chafing against the establishment of that rigid dogma, and mm -hmm. they're contemplating the same kind of question. Is, is it a failure, and why should it be a failure for Comac to feel that feeling? Mm -hmm. um, just like back to Reef with the Party, uh, mm -hmm. the conversation about sex, that seems to be a through line in this narrative uh, about allow yourself a little bit of grace. Yes. Yes. Gr grace. I mean, grace, just like anything, is something that you should have. You know, I, I, l let me rephrase that. Grace is the only thing you shouldn't have in moderation. Um, mm. You know, gr oh, great. The way I think Put of that it on is, a bumper is, sticker. <laughs> great. Gr I feel like grace is 
is just like forgiveness in cursive. It's mm-hmm. it's this whole idea of of under it's it's in a way it's it's a very je- grace is a very Jedi concept because grace is understanding and acknowledging that that man is fallible that you know we we are not. You know, as luminous as we want to be, we are fallible. And grace is acknowledging your own fallibility and also another's fallibility, which, mm-hmm. man, we should set up some bumper stickers on a tea Public store with just all this crazy nonsense that I'm I'm saying. all about it. That, we already <laughs> got our first one. Oh, I love it. But <laughs> let's, uh, so going back, we I feel like there's a lot more story, but there are really only two big points to discuss. Yeah. And so it's we, we got the twenty five years ago story. Mm-hmm. We nailed that down. And so the only other points I think that that need to be made for purposes of understanding why this novel is 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 good, why it's important, are um, the is it the Ni- the Nihil the Nihil the Nihil the Nihil the Nihil, See, Nihil again, and pronunciation. the Dringir. Yeah, the Nihil um, and and the Dringir stuff, and then the. Um, all the dark, all the dark side, all the visions, all of that. But yeah, so when the Jedi Masters enter into the, uh, I love this terrarium and space station, <laughs> um, they they feel this dark presence. Orla and Comac both have visions of the dark side. Uh, there are these idols there. They're 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 these statues. They perceive that the darkness is emanating off of these statues so they decide that they're going to take the statues back to the temple on Coruscant in order to basically purge them of their darkness well it doesn't go that way (laughs) simultaneously Wreath meets uh, these characters uh, one is a little girl named Nan, mm-hmm. and her guardian, and they appear to be down and out characters. Mm-hmm. Uh, they represent themselves that way. Wreath saves Nan from being kidnapped by a terrible man in a red scarf, mm-hmm. and Wreath, who has considered himself to be an academic. Uh, not a person of action actually lops off this guy's arm and then has this kind of existential crisis about having <laughs> used his lightsaber to lop off the arm, um, even though it was to save Nan mm-hmm. from being kidnapped. Yeah. In the course of this, Dez is exploring the station with Wreath and Nan. Mm-hmm. And goes into goes through a door in the lower rings of the station, uh, and disappears. Yes, seemingly uh, is disintegrated, ostensibly disintegrated. Okay, yes. so a third tract that's going on here mm-hmm. is that Affy is exploring the space station, and she finds hieroglyphic like markings mm-hmm. um, of travelers who are communicating with each other Mm -hmm. and she finds among those markings the sign of the bind guild Mm -hmm. which she is a part of her adopted mother uh scover is Mm -hmm. the in charge of and she finds the symbol of her parents ship Mm -hmm. which her parents have been lost they worked for the bind guild and that's why scover has adopted her I, I found, especially during that part, there was something interesting, I thought, is that whole conversation about how bizarre it was that these markings were there because mm-hmm. no one writes anymore. Right. Did I get, did I, which, which I thought was, was fascinating because that's not something you ever really think about in Star Wars is in the future, well, I guess in the past in this case, when it, with a highly you know, technologically advanced society, you have no reason to write anymore. Everything is typed. Everything's on data pads. But, right. you know, so, so the, this, this whole discovery of, of the Bind Guild sigil and, and, and all of this leads to a very interesting 
kind of moral conundrum within Afi and within her understanding of the Bind Guild because she, lo and behold, she goes to find out that the Bind Guild, although they aren't slavers, they don't have slaves, they were basically hiring indentured servants. And, you know, and the way indentured servitude works is you have someone for a period of years. That's mm-hmm. there, your indentured servant for that period of years. And she finds out that, uh, that Scover, her adopted mother, was offering incentives, or I guess the Bind Guild was, but offering incentives to these indentured servants where they would actually cut years off of their time if they took on, I suppose, more dangerous missions. Mm -hmm. And so she has this internal struggle where she's like, did my parents die because they were trying to cut years off of their indentured servitude? And did the woman that did the woman that did that is she now my adopted mother? So we, we see this other, you know, up until this point in the story, I feel like Affy was kind of the kind of, I don't know, happy-go-lucky, sort of sassy, mm-hmm. like, I'm I'm actually the boss. And I think at one point, Leox actually says, you know, I'm not the boss. She's actually the boss. This is her ship. She's the captain. And it, it kind of knocks her down a peg, just like realization does for all the young characters in this mm-hmm. novel. Um, but... So that's that's kind of like you said the the third or fourth or five hundredth plot that's going on in this wonderful but somewhat complicated book, um, right? And then the the other idea kind of goes back to these two characters of Nan and 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 Haig. So we have this this group of miscreants. I guess that's the best way to describe them. Are they miscreants? Let's see what Wikipedia calls them. Not miscreants, marauders, which I guess is mm. kind of synonymous. Of um, the Nihil, these baddies, and the Nihil um, are very active during the High Republic era. They're an outer rim territory kind of group. I, I get the impression, and I don't think it's any secret that the outer rim is kind of the Wild West um, I of think so, the yeah. Star Wars universe. So you have this group of marauders. I immediately think about Emphis Nest in Solo, mm-hmm. um, and lo and behold, Nan and, and Haig were actually members of this group of marauders. So you now have shocking what, yeah, you have, you have the, the bind guild, you have the Jedi, and now you have the Nihil. You're getting all these different groups together. And, and then you add one more in, Oh my gosh. And I'll, I'll (laughs) let, I'll let you take talk about that one group. But the interesting thing that we get here and the important thing about, um, you know, wreath saving nan from the man in the red scarf is that then it's almost like nan is hesitant to do what she should do as a member mm-hmm. of the nihil and so both characters kind of have this 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 conflict wreath especially because you know he was still questioning himself when he cut off the arm in very obi-wan kenobi fashion and but now he's seeing that by taking that risk by crossing that proverbial Kyber bridge, if you will, he did something that unbeknownst to him, I guess it's, it's, it's the force that, that allows stuff like this to happen, that helped him in the future. But that's kind of the big situation that's going on with Nan and, and, and Haig and the Nihil. But um, talk about this other group that gets introduced. So, so this other group is the Drangir. Mm-hmm. And so... Everybody leaves the station, so the the vessel, everybody reboards. They take the idols. They go back to Coruscant, uh, and, and then they, take they the, have and they take the idols because they believe that this these visions and this darkness that they're sensing is with is coming from the idols because Correct. there's this this whole idea that the dark side. First of all, the dark side comes from from people, but the Sith, I believe, had developed a way to imbue certain objects with mm-hmm. the dark side, and so the the Jedi have determined the Jedi on the on on man, I love this terrarium and space station. have determined <laughs> that the source of these visions, this the source of these warnings, and the source of the darkness is actually the statues themselves. So you're like, right. oh man, we have to get them back to Coruscant. So they load them up using their right. Jedi uh, voodoo um, to make sure that the darkness doesn't escape, and they uh, they head back to Coruscant. So 
Go ahead. And and so everybody goes back to Coruscant. Well, it turns out everybody needs to go back to the space station. The, the I love this bar and terrarium um, <laughs> for different reasons, and it's not the margaritas. Uh, yeah. So when Orla and Comac get the idols back to the Jedi Temple, uh, we are introduced to what I think we thought is another original um, yeah. creation of Claudia Gray's, which is the Virgins in the Force, mm-hmm. uh, the Shrine in the Depths. So we find out that the Jedi Temple is built on top of an ancient Sith shrine. Mm-hmm. That's which so is insane. Just, it, 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 I mean, this really does it for me um, mm-hmm. because now we're getting into like um, a geographical metaphor of mm-hmm. consciousness, um, mm-hmm. which is, you know, we're going to have another episode on Joseph Campbell's hero's journey. Um, we've already mentioned it a few times, but in general, the hero's journey is a metaphor for Joseph Campbell. It's a metaphor for our own individual descent into our unconscious to find the source of our own problems, uh, our own strength, and then bring that back up to consciousness. And this is why there's a cycle in the hero's journey. And so the, the geographical layering uh, mm-hmm. and the descent beyond the Jedi temple and the connection between the, the dark shrine and the light temple, I think really informs what, Claudia is doing with the character of Comac and realizing that you can't divide uh, that dark from the light. And so she describes the virgins in the force as a nexus of power and energy that could be put to many uses, both worthy and wicked. Virgences rise of their own accord. They could not be created, only discovered. Man. And that's in chapter 14. By the way, I just checked it because I'm legitimately curious about this, but the shrine mm-hmm. in the depths, um, let's see, it first, it looks like it first appeared. So here are the appearances. So the High Republic into the dark. Um, okay. So that's the first time it was identified as the shrine in the depths. But it looks like the first time it ever appeared in Star Wars was in Tarkin. So Ooh. we 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 knew... In, in Tarkin, that there was a shrine beneath the Jedi Temple, but the Shrine in the Depths, capital S, capital D, was a Claudia Gray uh, concept, and I love the concept, dude. It reminds me so much. And again, I, I'm I'm sorry if you're if you're not a fan of the, of the movie, listeners, but uh, I, you're going to find out that Ryan and I are. But it reminds me so much of Octo, um, mm-hmm. and. Because you know one, one the thing, Prime that, Jedi. Yeah. So you know the big deal on Octo, which is the island where where mm-hmm. Luke is, um, when Ray finds him, and at the end of the Force Awakens, if I remember correctly, Octo was, if not the first, one of the first Jedi temples, kind of Jedi right. shrine temple areas, and I mean I don't think they explicitly say it but there's almost a Sith kind of darkness shrine in the depths beneath the first yes. Jedi temple. And so right. a- again it's just as George Lucas would say it's poetry it rhymes. It's just it's so cool how it's almost like all of the all of these stories and all of the geography like you were saying Ryan it it pushes us to this idea that everyone is a dark side and a light side and our yes. our subconscious it just what matters is which one takes control and i just i love being able to see that play out like this but i think the the, the shrine in the depths is huge and the fact that it's only been explicitly mentioned in in as the sh- shrine in the depths in this book but then only mentioned twice <laughs> in all of canon I think this is going to start to play a bigger role in the Star Wars universe. It has to. Well, yeah, it seems like one of those things that they drop in to see if it gets a response, which we're responding to it. Oh, yeah. And and then they might develop a storyline out of it. So 
something interesting that ties into this that's kind of important to know for the sake of Star Wars. I can't remember if this is considered canon or not still. But so in the Old Republic, before the Sith, you know, the creation of the Sith, everyone was a Jedi. They were all Force users. Mm -hmm. And eventually what happened is certain members of the Jedi Order started to disagree with the best way to use the Force to help the most people. They kind of had a, let's use the atomic bomb. Let's do it that mm -hmm. way. Let's use power. And power is the way that we should take over. And so they, they truly felt that what they were doing was, was right. It was, you know, um, it was the, the most good for the most people kind of approach. And the Jedi were like, no, 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 no. We can't do that. We can't give into our emotions. So they split. I think it was called um, Hundred Years of Darkness was that, was that period mm -hmm. where then the Sith and the Jedi would constantly be at war with one another. And it was during that time that the Sith Temple was built on Coruscant. And then only after that, that the Jedi Temple was built on top of it. And so it's, it's, it's just fascinating because it also goes to show uh, this idea of y you can't whitewash, you can't bury, you can't hide the past. You can't hide the dark things that happened in the past um, because the truth will is always the way that you need to go because even though they're trying to hide this shrine in the depths, even though they're trying to to ignore the dark side, it still creeps out. And mm. it you don't resolve that issue until you actually deal with it. Um, but that's that's all I have to say on the shrine in the depths. At least oh, that's, for this that's book. great. That I mean, that's a very psychological mm -hmm. explanation of it, which is what Joseph Campbell is saying about myth: is that it's uh, you know, mm -hmm. pre psychology psychology. Mm -hmm. That's so cool, man. That is so. I love Joseph Campbell. I but, do too. So we have the Dream Gear. Who yeah, are? Yeah. So they get the idols to the shrine in the depths, uh -huh. and they realize. Once they take off the protective spell on the idols, they realize that the darkness was not coming from the idols. It, the, the idols were maintaining or preventing the spread of darkness on the space station. So that's yeah. reason number one that Jedi need to start going back to the space station. Mm -hmm. Affy wants to go investigate. She finds out about indentured servants in the Bind Guild, and she wants to go back and investigate. Is there another reason? Oh, uh, the Nihil. The Nihil. Yeah. Because they they realize that Nan yeah. and Haig. In, uh, in, a truly, in a truly bizarre way, they realize that. Like, I love Claudia, but even I was like, it was almost like a, wait, she had a blue streak in her hair. Her hair was blue. Yeah. Who else has, oh no. And so I kind of like laughed a little bit at that. But um, I think those were the three reasons they went back. Right. Um, but my, I, I feel like that that moment of them realizing that they didn't s protect this man, man. I love this bar and space station from the darkness. They actually <laughs> released it. In my mind, I'm like, they just turned off the electricity to the fences, and the T Rex is now yes. getting out into the park, S scraping its tiny arm down the yes. uh, caution electric sign. So, so they get back um, to the space station, and pretty much things have gone a little bit crazy so we meet the drain gear at this point mm -hmm. and what we find out is that they had blended into the jungle-like atmosphere of i love this tropical cafe and terrarium <laughs> and uh it's different every time i love it and so the the drain gear are like they're kind of like ints they're like mm -hmm. tree people but they're um viney so they don't like the ints have trunks, but yeah. the drangir are like a mass of vines that have spikes on the vines. Um, yeah, they're they're crazy looking. Yeah, did you, you should pull look up on the, Wik uh, Wikipedia? Yeah, they almost look like an H.P. Lovecraft monster. Yeah, it's it's yeah they they look like really bummed out ints, pretty much. Like an ant right. is like. And it's like, I'm happy I've been taking care of my body. And then the dream gear are kind of like, hey, man, check out my Twitch channel. And they're just yeah. kind of <laughs> crunched up. And, 
But um, again, I'm doing all these motions and body physical comedy and we're a <laughs> podcast. So this is where we're getting into heavy spoilers for the book. Like we haven't already mm-hmm. done that. But, you know, we, we, we find out. So first of all, Reith decides that he's going to go and search, look around, figure out what's going on, um, you know, do his Jedi Padawan thing. And he goes down to where Dez was, where he evaporated, where he blew up, where his molecules were pulled apart. And lo and behold, that didn't happen. He actually was transported to an entirely different planet made up entirely of... That we don't get a name of. Yeah, no name. So we could make one up, but I'm not going to. So, And he's greeted by, what do you know, more dream gear. And he notices when he lands in his in his pod on this unnamed Dringir planet, a total rainforest cafe planet. We can assume that if all these plants are there, uh, even though they move. So he lands there and he sees that there is another pod that had landed. And an astute reader will, of course, be thinking, gee, I wonder if maybe Dez isn't dead. Lo and behold, he's not dead. He's absolutely rolling on whatever, you know, you want to talk about getting captured and being drugged. Imagine if it's plants that captured you. So he is just rolling and gets, gets told by the dream gear. You got to kill the other. They're trying to get right. back up to the space station because they can't figure out how to get back up to the space station. And so the dream gear convince Des drugged Des who can't really see or understand anything. You got to kill this other person. If you kill this other person, I think that they say they're going to free him. You know, you're going to be done. This is good for you. So Dez is like, okay, whatever. I mean, I got to do this. Um, Not realizing that it's Reese. They fight, kind of, and they end up not killing each other. They both hop back in one of the pods and get back up to, man, I love this rainforest bar, grill, and cafe. (laughs) (laughs) That's the... (laughs) And um, they are followed, of course, by the Dream Gear. And the party just keeps growing from there. Yes, and uh, Comac and Orla are facing off against the other Dringir that are on the space station, mm-hmm. while Affy is researching the glyphs that she had found to see if her parents had actually died there. And the Nihil are also simultaneously orbiting around the station. Uh, Leox has put the vessel into orbit at exactly the opposite side. Mm -hmm. So they're like blocked by the space station. Exactly. Yes. That's some, some good, some good piloting. If I do say so myself. And I, I just, I love it so much because I'm pretty sure at this point, like the big, so it's not just Nan and Haig now. It's like a whole bunch of the Nihil. And if I remember correctly, the way they describe these big ships is they're almost like Frankenstein together, like different pieces mm-hmm. of different ships. It makes me think right. of, uh, I think it's the Reavers from Firefly, uh, Joss Whedon's Firefly, where it's like, no joke, they have these big, like, grungy looking ships, except on theirs, they have a whole bunch of skulls on the front, kind of like you see on semis, like they have the bear sometimes. Um, but I th- that might just be an Oklahoma thing. We might have listeners somewhere else yeah. who are like, what are they talking <laughs> like, about semis? Where the bears? hell do they live? <laughs> yeah. We live in the rainforest cafe planet. Surprise. But, um, but so we have like this, Oh, everything is going crazy. And then we get to this finale finally, where, uh, the finale that we alluded to when geo decides that he is going to, uh, save the day, which he does. Mm-hmm. And they pretty much, they pull a James Cameron's aliens and they determine that the way they're going to get rid of all of these dang dream gear is they are going to open up the airlock into, right. into space. And so they do. And everything, all the bad plant boys get sucked out of the space mm-hmm. station and our, uh, our protagonist almost gets sucked out, but is right. saved by geode geode. And so that's, uh, that's kind of the end question mark of the dream gear for purposes right. of this narrative um, because the dream gear are all gone it's also important to note that the space station can now actually be used um, I don't know if they mentioned this in the book but 
it makes me wonder what all of these plants were just sucked out. First, okay, did any of the plants themselves that weren't Dringier get sucked out? I think they did. I think so too, yeah. It makes me feel so bad for the gardening robots. Who well, now they got have... sucked out too. Okay, well, that's good. So technically, I mean, droids can survive in space, so they still kind of mm-hmm. have a purpose. So you know what? I don't feel as bad anymore. Never mind. But um, So the, the conflict leading up to that is... Uh, the Jedi pit the Drangir against the Nihil. It's so good. It's so good. And it, it's it's just like, it's a real, like, I don't know, what was that? Uh, WWE <laughs> Royal <laughs> Rumble Yeah, it's where vibe. you just sit and, you sit and wait for, for, you know, Stone Cold Steve Austin and Goldberg to fight each other. Yeah. <laughs> and then when they're done, you go in and you, you, you take, you, you sweep everything up. Right, oh, man, but um, uh, yeah, <laughs> but so I can't remember and refresh my memory. What happens with the with the Nihil at this point? Do they pretty much they just so, go away? Many of them are killed by the Drangir. Mm-hmm. Nan, so Nan encounters Wreath, and she allows him to go free mm-hmm. as a one time thing since he saved her mm-hmm. from the kidnapper. Nan shows up in conversation with the leader of the Nihil at, at the end of the book. Yeah. Um, and he kind of absolves her of any wrongdoing and says that it's all the Jedi's fault. Hmm. And they put all the blame on the Jedi. So it seemed like they were kind of setting up a future conflict. Yes. Um, at the same time, this is right after. So the the opening of starlight beacon finally happens. Um, wreath is an apprentice without a master mm-hmm. and he asks Comac to be his new master. Comac agrees, uh, which, you know, I think we all were excited to read. Um, and they go back out to starlight beacon. So Wreath's disposition has changed. He no longer wants to be a meek young man in a library. He wants to be out on the frontier, uh, and he's chosen Comac to emulate. And so he finds himself at Starlight Beacon. We know that the Nihil are out there plotting their revenge, and we know that Comac and Wreath are on the frontier as well. And um, Queen Thrandeka, Mm -hmm. I hope I got that right, Uh, Queen Thrandeka uh, is the one who's dedicating Starlight Beacon, and we see that she has united the two planetoids. I love it. Um, and so it's it's all good vibes there at the end until we get that last little cliffhanger of Nan in conversation mm-hmm. with the leader of the Nihil. Big post credit scene vibes. Whenever it is, that yeah. I feel like... Uh, if only she said McClunky. <laughs> McClunky. <laughs> so I feel like this is a perfect way to 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 get into what this means for the larger Star Wars universe. I feel like there's one more big conversation that you and I have to have, and I'll save that for the very end. But this is kind of, by my estimation, what you should take from this book, ideas-wise, as important moving forward. The mm-hmm. first idea is the Starlight Beacon itself. Um, so the Starlight Beacon is everywhere in the High Republic stuff. It's in this book. It's in all the mm-hmm. comics. I'm pretty sure it's in a couple of the other... Uh, High Republic books, but it actually even shows up during the Age of the Empire. So I'm a big fan, as as Ryan knows, of the Star Wars comics. So the way that Marvel has redone these comics is you have one Star Wars series that is now over, but it covered the period of time between A New Hope and Empire. And then you have these new comics that take place directly after Empire leading up to Return of the Jedi. And so the situation is in the, I think it's the second issue of Star Wars, the new series, we find out that on Hoth, or I mean, technically you could say Hoth, which is how George Lucas pronounces it. But in the second issue, we find out that um, in 3 ABY, Commander Grek of the Rebel Alliance um, used the Starlight Beacon Station as an inspiration for Operation Starlight, which was a plan to reassemble the Alliance fleet uh, following the 
big fracture after the Battle of Hoth. So we're going to see a lot more regarding the Starlight Beacon, I think, in future issues uh, of the comics, in future books, and potentially in future shows and movies. But the, the other two big issues, um, I mean, we've already talked about. First one is the idea of, of Jedi being allowed to have sex but not being allowed attachment. Um, that, I, th- I think, as an idea, is going to get explored more, especially considering up until this point, at least I did, I thought that Jedi had to be celibate um, just as, as a rule of thumb. And, of course, the Sith Shrine. So as, as we were saying earlier, we have these two different instances that the Sith Shrine is mentioned. You have the, the first time it's mentioned in Tarkin, which I'm sure we're going to get to because our plan is to cover as many, if not all, of these canon novels um, on this podcast. But this idea of the Shrine in the Depths is going to come up again. Um, but then one, Ryan, that we haven't talked about that I wanted to bring up is just for the future of the Star Wars universe is this idea that I think we hear for the first time. It's the idea of Padawan braids not being mandatory. So I wonder, I wonder if in the prequels, the reason why everyone has a Padawan braid is because as we've discussed, it's more dogmatic, but we learn in this book that it's completely up to the Jedi master. If he wants his Padawan to have a braid, um, which I think is fascinating. It leads me to a, a completely unrelated question. No, it's, you know what? It is a related question. And that question is, if you were a Jedi master, would you require your Padawan to have a Jedi braid? I think that depends on if my master had required me to have a Jedi braid. It's, it's like it's like hazing. It's like, I'm never going to haze. Yeah. Never, unless I'm hazed myself. By the way, we're an anti-hazing <laughs> podcast. I want to make that abundantly clear. But it also brings up another question that I had, which is, I, you know, you, you have the braid. That's one thing. But then what's the deal with the little ponytail? Is that a part of it? Or is that just, like, did Obi, I feel like Qui-Gon was like, all right, Obi-Wan, you have to have a braid. And Obi-Wan's like, master, what about the small ponytail? Can I have that too? <laughs> so, so maybe, maybe that's, I think the small ponytail was just a Qui-Gon thing. And then since he made Obi-Wan do it, Obi-Wan made Anakin do it. And that's ultimately yeah, why like he turned that. to the dark side. But um, aside <laughs> the from, small ponytail. Yeah. So, so my big takeaways again are the starlight beacon, uh, the Sith shrine, the concept of Jedi not um, being celibate and, uh, and Padawan braids. Is there anything else you think um, that, that, that people should take from this novel um, as important for purposes of the larger canon? One thing that stood out to me was um, that there is still conflict in the absence of the Jedi-Sith conflict. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of other forces out there. The, the Drangir are described as Dark Force users. Mm-hmm. Uh, the initial spell was put on them by uh, by the Sith. And so there's a conversation. I, I don't remember if it's Orla or Comac, but there's a questioning about um, whether the Drangir would be more powerful than Sith if the Sith Ooh. had to look to control them. So I think we could look to see more of the Drangir. Mm-hmm. Um, and beyond that, I'd really like to follow Comac and Wreath. Yes, I would love a um, a almost. I don't know if you if you if you read these these comics or not, but so they had there was a one like a six issue run, and it was just Obi Wan and Anakin. That was pretty cool. It was. It was before he had his long hair. It was short haired, short haired Anakin. But the other series is they did um, Kanan. They did his kind of Jedi upbringing following Order 66. So, I mean, the precedent is there to have a comic series about it. But I feel like a Comac and a Wreath story would be really cool. And I would honestly love to see them in live action at some point. And I would too. At the rate that this stuff is getting greenlit, I wouldn't put it past Disney to eventually have this stuff happen. But 
I feel like this leads in to what I think is the ultimate question that you and I both had about this story, and it's how we will we will end this our first episode. Dude, what is spice? We have no idea. Oh yeah, okay. And yeah, we thought we knew. So this this uh, this conundrum. <laughs> this is how the, okay. This is how this conundrum started. So first of all, it's important to understand the beginnings of spice in the Star Wars universe. So. If any of you all out there are Dune fans or, or Frank Herbert fans in general, you'll probably know that George Lucas was also a massive Frank Herbert fan. It's part of the reason why Tatooine takes place on a planet like Arrakis, um, a desert planet. It's also why um, there is a location in Tatooine called the Dune Sea. It's because uh, Lucas was a big fan of Dune. And for those of you who know Dune, you know that the entire series centers around um, the spice melange, which I've determined um, smells and tastes like a cinnamon dolce latte mixed with a pumpkin spice latte from Starbucks. Except it's the kind of spi- it's the kind of latte that if you drink it, you have the ability to fold space time. So lots and lots of espresso in that. Wow. But so knowing that that it's literally a spice, like it looks like cinnamon in the novel in in the Dune series, and knowing that. And knowing the spice mines of Kessel are something that are mentioned from, I think, the first 10 minutes of A New Hope. Whenever mm-hmm. C-3PO and R2-D2 are, are, are in the desert and saying, you know, we'll, we'll be sent to the spice mines of Kessel. Or, or, you know. So it's really er- from really early on, we know that spice is a thing and that it's mined on Kessel. And then we, of course, see the Kessel mines in Solo. And so up until this point, I'm assuming, okay, it's a spice, it's mined, so it's probably a rock that you break up into a powdery, sand-like substance, and, you know, maybe you, it's something you do like, like a, it's like a cocaine type thing, maybe. But we, we see spice being ingested um, by Leox, and then we see him, um, you know, enabling being the, hey, kids, you want to try Spice, um, to <laughs> Dez later. But those two ways are completely different. Leox is smoking at the beginning, yeah, and then he gives it and to Dez. He gives it to Dez at the end. Oh, I, you know, I've just realized another crucial point May- for how this uh, uh, fits into the galaxy. Yeah, how? Is that Dez is going to take, uh, Dez is going to self-exile. Man, he's pulling a Yoda. And a Luke. Ooh, yes. Uh, Wreath goes to see Dez as he's um, recuperating, and we find out that Dez has had his connection to the Force severed Man. by the Drangir, which uh, reinforces our reading that these are significantly powerful beings. So they've severed his Force uh, connection, and the Jedi healers have tried to piece it back together, but Dez doesn't think that he will ever be the same, and he's taking what is called the bearish vow to go into a contemplative exile. Man. Uh, which seems to inform Yoda's exile uh, to Dagobah and Luke's exile to Octo. Man. I So this... This brings up a sort of pet project of mine, this, this concept. And I want to see this so much in the Star Wars universe. So I am as much a fan as I am of Star Wars. I am a massive horror fan. Um, Ryan, Ryan knows this because he's been listening to my old podcast all the way through right now. And I love horror so much. And it makes me wonder, that's something that we really never see in the Star Wars universe, is just something that's just straight up horror. And this idea of the Sith being able to give dark side powers to other sentient beings, it makes me wonder if we will ever see any iteration of almost a Jedi exorcist show, where these Jedi are going out and pulling the dark side out of these sentient beings and it makes me want it so bad it's i mean i i am so unenthused right now if you could see <laughs> the difference in looks on our two faces right now ryan is not a ryan is not about <laughs> horror i feel like it's it's i 
the fact that you were listening to a horror podcast to support <laughs> me makes me so makes me makes me makes me love you even more, dude. So I appreciate it. But I oh um, man, I'm happy to and and let me just recommend it to everyone out there. I, I'm not a horror fan, but my co-host, my co-falconer here Falconer. is an excellent storyteller. And he utilizes the medium, and it's it's just a it's a really fun tale. Thanks, man. And I think by the time this podcast You're comes welcome. out, um, you can check it out at dylandirwin.bandcamp.com. It's called the Nightgate Journal, and it has nothing to do with Star Wars. But I'm gonna get back on track. And um, since we don't really know what spice is, and we hope we can figure it out in the future, I want to start a practice. I think on this podcast. I don't know if it'll last longer than this episode or not, but it seems appropriate. And the question that is throughout this book is almost like a Zen riddle, if you will. And it, at the very beginning of the book, we find out that Jorah, the late Jorah Mali, always asks Wreath a specific question. And that question is, Mm -hmm why no Jedi can cross the Kyber Arch alone. So the Kyber Arch is in the Jedi Temple, and it's exactly what it sounds like. It's an arch that's made of Kyber. It's pretty straightforward. And it's this whole question of, you know, you have to to cross it. You, as Wreath kind of points out, you get up and you walk over it. And so he never really understood the question. He always thought the question was stupid. But... The answer that I was kind of able to to glean from it based on the book, I mean, Wreath kind of gleans it himself, is he makes the point, I think when he's in the chapter that you may be looking at right now, is this whole idea, yeah, that even when when Wreath was quote-unquote crossing the Kyber Arch, he said, I mean, there are people under me, so I'm not even worried about falling because they're down there. And even in in that realization, Wreath is realizing that no Jedi ever crosses the Kyber Arch alone because he always crosses it with all the other Jedi with him, both literally as well as kind of figuratively. The idea that, uh, that, that you know, we... I don't know, we, we stand on the shoulders of giants. You know, we, we are are made up of all the ones that came before. It's that scene in The Rise of Skywalker where Rey Mm -hmm. hears the voice of all the other Jedis where she's crossing her own metaphorical kyber arch. But the question that I would have is, what is your kyber arch that you have to cross? And do you cross it alone? And if you don't, who crosses it with you? Claudia really knocks it out of the park with the description of the Kyber Arch. Uh, When Wreath goes to cross it on his own, this is before he's come to the realization that uh, before it was all about me, not about us. From now on, I'm putting us first. Uh, He goes, he crosses the Kyber Arch on his own while he's contemplating his master's uh, Cohen riddle. And when he enters the room... She has very evocative description about how if you if you show up at the right time in the morning when the sun is coming up over Coruscant, mm-hmm. it shines through the windows and it dazzles on the uh, Kyber Arch and it shoots rainbows all across the room, and brilliant shimmering rainbows. And it, it just it's just such a wonderful moment uh, reading this book. I just thought I wanted to mention it. It's so Claudia is the kind of writer. I don't know how to say this. I suppose you can be a good author without being a good writer, but Claudia is a good author and a good writer. And, Oh yeah. And I am, I am of the thought as I'm sure Ryan is that we become better people by reading good authors and good writers and so, Claudia, on behalf of the Millennium Falconers Book Club, thank you for making all of us better people. Thank you, Claudia. <laughs> but And this, la- this last line that Master Comac says, when Wreath asks, what comes next, Master? Master Comac says, anything could happen, and that is the joy of it. <sighs> amen. Amen. Or whatever the Jedi equivalent of amen is. But, Ryan... Speaking of what comes next, we did it. We did our first episode. 
of the Millennium Falconers book club. Buddy. We did it. Um, I'm so excited. It's only five hours long. It's all, and you know what? <laughs> since it's a once, I was thinking about this. Since it's a once a month podcast, I'm totally fine with these things being long episodes because you have all month to listen to it. Um, which reminds me, the next book we're going to be covering is going to be Master and Apprentice, again, by Claudia Gray. The thing that I love about doing all these Claudia Gray books is we're jumping eras. So we did the High Republic mm-hmm. era this time. We're going to the prequel era next time with Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan. And then after that, we're going to jump into Lost Stars, which is just mm-hmm. it's surrounding um, the, the original trilogy. And then we're finishing up with Bloodline that is all about... No, we're not finishing up with Bloodline. We're going to do Princess Leia, Leia. and then we're going to yeah. do Bloodline. So we're doing all kinds of stuff. Bloodline is, of course, um, just before the sequel. It's going to be trilogy. great. We're going to have so much fun. But um, our next episode is going to be coming out June 1st. As a quick rule of thumb, uh, new episodes of this show come out at least the first Tuesday of every month. Ryan and I, uh, we're kind of laid back about this. We know that we're going to give you an episode at least once a month, and then... If we have free time and we're bored, maybe we'll record like movie commentaries or something. I don't know, but um, that'd be great. But it's a it's a once uh, a month thing. When you said we're we're laid back, we're like uh, Lee Ox and Geo. We really are, and I uh, I wonder which one is which. And uh, you know what? The, I don't. I don't know. <laughs> the great thing about it is I, I don't care. <laughs> we, yeah, we don't need I'm to either, know. I'm either a rock or I'm smoking them. You know what I mean? <laughs> and what a great way to end it. But um, but as always, he says, ironically, um, ending the first podcast, um, remember, the force will be with you. Always.